for Sunday, February 28th, offered by Memorial Presbyterian Church of Dayton, Indiana, in partnership with Bethany Presbyterian Church of Lafayette, Indiana, and Elston Presbyterian Church of Lafayette, Indiana. We are so happy you have joined us for worship today and pray you will be blessed by this experience. We pray also that you are staying safe as well as we continue to distance ourselves from one another to prevent spread of COVID-19. Out of concern for the well-being and safety of all of us within our communities of faith, our congregations have suspended in-person worship for the foreseeable future and until further notice. So please plan to worship with us by video for the time being. We will be celebrating Holy Communion next Sunday, so please prepare for it. So we will invite you to bring your elements and have it with you on hand. And we will be so thankful to see you again. In Isaiah 58, God issues a call and a challenge to become repairers of the breach, to look beyond our own doors and share what we have with those in need. Presbyterians worldwide join in sharing God's love with our neighbors in need around the world by providing relief from natural disasters food for the hungry, and support for the poor and oppressed through their gifts to one great hour of sharing. Haiti is one such place. In 2010, Haiti was devastated by an earthquake which has taken years to overcome. Few understand this as well as Andral Estes. He lost his home and his career in Port-au-Prince. Thanks to one great hour of sharing, he now farms on the central plateau and works with his neighbors to build a new life. Andral lives in an eco-village designed to be completely sustainable. Their Presbyterian Church partners worked with the residents to build their community and secure livelihoods for their future. Education for the children became the next priority. With new skills and resources, residents of the eco-village could afford school fees and uniforms. Individual Presbyterian churches helped them build the school. We have been doing this since 2014. We started to construct the school since January 2014 and we opened it in September 2014. Through one great hour of sharing, Presbyterians across the United States help make new lives possible for those like Andral, those whose lives have been turned upside down at home and abroad. Comment tu as senti au soupat de soupat à l'école? Ben, ça te malais parce que madame connaît les madame connaît. Qui sont arrivés mais venir leur grandir? Infirmière. Ça que faut arriver mais venir infirmière leur grandir. Donc à aider les peuples. Yes, to help the people. To answer God's call to be repairers of the breach, with your gifts to one great hour of sharing, lives are changed and hope is restored. Thank you for your generosity. For when we all do a little, it adds up to a lot. Now let us prepare our hearts and our minds to worship God.
responsive call to worship. We gather in the season of Lent, a time to examine our hearts and our lives. And journey with Christ through the suffering of the world. Let us pick up our crosses and follow Christ on a path that is lined with God's love. God has marked us as beloved dust and called us together to worship. The psalmist assures us that God's goodness and mercy will follow us, even pursue us all the days of our life. As God's forgiven people receive this goodness and mercy and live a new life in the grace of Jesus Christ.
one another. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. Now pass the peace to anyone around you and enjoy the peace of Christ. Enjoy passing it to one another. Please join me in the spirit of prayer. Holy Spirit, open our hearts to receive your word. Reveal to us the good news and enable us to trust in the promise of salvation in Jesus Christ. Amen. The Hebrew lesson this morning comes from the book of Genesis, chapter 17, verses 1 through 7, and then 15 through 16. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. And I will make my covenant between me and you and will make you exceedingly numerous. Then Abram fell on his face and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the ancestor of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. God said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall give rise to nations. Kings of peoples shall come from her. Today's epistle lesson comes from Romans chapter 4, verses 13 to 25. Listen now for the word of the Lord. For the promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. If it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void, for the law brings wrath. But where there is no law, neither is there violation. For this reason, it depends on faith in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his descendants, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham, for he is the father of all of us, as it was written. I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist, Hoping against hope, he believed that he would become the father of many nations, according to what was said, so numerous shall your descendants be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was already as good as dead, for he was about a hundred years old. Or when he considered the bareness of Saren's womb. No distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God. He grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, being fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Therefore, his faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now the words it was reckoned to him were written not for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be reckoned to us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was handed over to death for our trespasses, and was raised for our justification. Friends, we proclaim Christ crucified, the wisdom and power of God. Thanks be to God. 
Friends, join me now in the spirit of prayer. Gracious and holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, our strength and our redeemer. In the precious and holy name of Jesus the Christ, we pray. Amen. Well, American Idol was one of the highest rated TV shows in the United States for several years, and now it's back for its 19th season with new judges and virtual auditions. One of the most entertaining parts of American Idol is when thousands of people audition just to become contestants on the show. Some of the performers and their stories make you laugh, and some are truly inspiring. Sadly, however, some of the contestants can't even carry a tune. It makes you wonder, what were they thinking when they decided to audition? Perhaps it's the allure of having that brief moment of fame. It can be truly sad to watch people make complete fools of themselves, hoping in vain for something that has absolutely no connection to reality. Now, don't get me wrong. We all need hope. In fact, we can't live without it. Hope is what keeps us moving forward, what motivates us. As Desmond Tutu puts it, hope is being able to see that there is light despite all the darkness. It's believing that there is light at the end of the tunnel, even when you can't see it. And living joyfully is certainly in a part of the Christian journey. So, imagine that you are 99 years old and your spouse is equally as old and you've never been able to have children. What would you think if God came to you and promised that you're going to be the ancestor of a multitude of nations? Now, you know what you're hearing is impossible from a practical point of view. But this doesn't, isn't just some fortune teller looking into a crystal ball who is speaking to you. It's God. Well, in today's scripture reading from Genesis, we're told that Abraham believed that it would happen as God promised. He believed he would become the father of of many nations, even though he didn't have an heir. That's called faith. Trusting in the promises of God. Trusting that God is going to do what God has promised to do. Faith means trusting even when something seems impossible. In Romans, Paul reminds us that Christians have a lot in common with Abraham. Abraham was made right before God, not by following the law, but by faith, by trusting in God's promises. Now, in Paul's time, there was a controversy in the church about whether Gentiles first needed to become Jews before they could become Christians. As the earliest Christians were Jewish, this seemed to be the way it worked. First, you were a Jew who followed the Jewish laws, and then you could also become a follower of Jesus. And yet Abraham lived before the law was given, so no one could say that Abraham was made righteous by following the law. So what was it about Abraham that made him righteous before God? It was his faith. Paul writes, Hoping against hope, Abraham believed that he would become the father of many nations, According to what was said, so numerous shall your descendants be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was already as good as dead, for he was about a hundred years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, being fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Now, like Abraham, there were those in Paul's own generation who were also made right by, before God by faith. Romans 6, 4.16 says, 
For this reason, it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his descendants, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham. So what binds God's people together is not their ethnicity, but it is the faith of Abraham. Abraham's children aren't just the Jews, but they are all of those who have faith. So Paul draws this parallel between us and Abraham. Like Abraham, we also trust in God's promise of life even in the midst of death. But as Christians, the way the promise of God manifests itself for us is through the promise of the resurrection. God's promise of life that we cling to is the promise and to the hope of eternal life. Paul Tillich, a 20th century German-born U.S. theologian and philosopher, preached that Hope is easy for every fool, but hard for the wise one. Everybody can lose himself in foolish hopes, but genuine hope is something rare and great. Till it goes on to say that where there is genuine hope, that which we hope for is already present for us in some form. What we hope for is at the same time here and not here. It has not yet been fulfilled, and it may never be fulfilled, but it is present in the now. It has already begun. This beginning drives the hope into the future. If the hope is rooted in the reality of something already present, the fulfillment of that hope is possible. Maybe not certain, but possible. And that's genuine hope. But where there isn't a beginning of what is hoped for, this type of hope Tillich calls foolish. For example, if you have an outstanding talent for singing, you might have a genuine hope of becoming the next American Idol. But if you can't sing, any hope of becoming the next American Idol is foolish hope. If the hope is rooted in the reality of something already present, the fulfillment of that hope is possible. Even if it never comes to pass, the hope is genuine. But where a beginning of what is hoped for is absent, it's merely wishful thinking or living in a fantasy world. It's foolishness. Is trusting in the promise of eternal life a, a foolish hope or a genuine hope for us? It's only genuine if the seeds of that promise are already present for us. If we're just longing for some pie in the sky by and by after we die, our hope is foolish. Don't we see evidence of eternal life here and now? Aren't the seeds of God's promise already present for us? We may see a glimpse of eternal life when we experience a, an act of genuine, self-giving love, a moment of absolute truth, or the beauty sunrise. Or we may feel the rush of sublime joy in the many big and small ways we experience the holy in our lives, perhaps when we worship God. Certainly we know it when we gather for the Lord's Supper, as we will next week, and partake in the communion of Christ's body and blood given for us. Our hope is genuine. Because there is already a presence and a beginning of what we hope for. The more we realize we are participating in eternal life right now, the deeper our hope becomes. Like Sarah and Abraham, we live by faith. We trust in God and we hope in God's promises. 
Now that doesn't mean that we turn a blind eye to reality. It doesn't mean we won't encounter setbacks in our lives. It doesn't mean that we won't struggle or go through dark nights of the soul. Just because we're people of faith doesn't mean we won't have trials. The difference is that for people of faith, the promises of God are always there to, to ground us. Our faith tells us that there is more to life than all the stuff of life that bogs us down. Like Abraham, we find ourselves hoping against hope. And friends, it's not a foolish hope at all. We hope for life even in the midst of death. We hope in the midst of the seeds of promise that are already with us. Friends, please join me now in affirming what it is we believe, saying together the affirmation of faith. The reconciling work of Jesus was the supreme crisis in the life of humankind. His cross and resurrection become personal crisis and present hope for women and men when the gospel is proclaimed and believed. In this experience, the Spirit brings God's forgiveness to all, moves people to respond in faith, repentance, and obedience, and initiates the new life in Christ. Pray with me. Creator God, you are worthy of all praise and worship. We 
praise you, creator of heaven and earth. We thank you for your life, death, and resurrection. As we ponder how the women found the empty tomb, encountered the angels, and then met you, Jesus, we hear the words, do not be afraid, spoken to us so clear. Lord, we give you thanks and praise for knowing every little detail of our lives. Every thought and feeling that goes through our minds and our hearts. You know each of our specific situations and understand our pain, our anxieties, our fears, our loneliness, our hopelessness, and our brokenness. We thank you for meeting us right where we are. Lord, the whole world is in your hands. You are in control. There is nothing that is impossible for you. So we ask in faith that your healing hand be upon all those suffering from the virus and the pandemic. We pray for those who are sick, that you would bring healing to them. For those who are caring for the sick, Lord, give them their strength and rest. For those who have lost their loved ones, God, those of this global pandemic, be present in their grief and comfort and healing, O oh God. We pray also for the protection of our public servants, for the leaders of the world of every level, that they would have the wisdom and the knowledge to make good decisions for all people. Lord, show them your truth and your path. Give them strength to do the right thing. We pray for those without a place to live, those who have lost their jobs, those who are struggling to keep their livelihood, those who do not have a support network, and for those who are not safe where they are. Have mercy on them, O Lord. Be with them and provide for their needs. Please use us as your hands and feet. Help us to continue to be a generous community and to be creative and wise with both your time, our time, and resources. Help us to pray, help us to listen to you and to others, Lord. Help us to notice what you are doing in our lives and in our world. Draw us into your kingdom work. Father, in your name, we give thanks and praise for the unrelenting, unfailing love. Guide us with your spirit of love, kindness, compassion, and grace, that we might have grace for ourselves and may extend that grace to others also. Help us to be more like you in these difficult times. Help us to remember that we are your beloved children. For we ask this in the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our and Father, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. What will it profit us to gain the whole world and forfeit our life? With all humility, let us make our offering to God, trusting not in worldly gain, but in God's sustaining grace. Should you wish to make a contribution, please feel free to use the addresses presented to you at this time for Memorial Presbyterian Church, for Bethany Presbyterian Church, and for Elston Presbyterian Church. 
all would feel good about getting your gifts. You would feel good about offering your gifts. Now and forevermore. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. 